So with that, Jeff, I'll, uh, I'll hand things over to you. Okay, thanks, Evelyn. Uh, yeah, so as she said, I'm going to walk through a handful of topics, mainly about cataloging, importing, um, and then we'll talk about um, aftershot uh, settings, uh, things like presets, defaults, keyword sets, copy sets, all those good things, how to set them up, how to use them, um, how to share them across computers. Uh, almost everybody has more than one computer today, and, and uh, using the application and having it set up similarly on multi multiple computers uh, sure makes life easy, so we'll talk through that. Um, but yeah, as questions come up, please let me know, uh, and we'll see if we can't uh, can't address them all. Uh, so with that, let's jump into cataloging. In some of the other uh, webinars, we've looked at a lot of photo editing, a uh, little bit of photo management, and this one's really going to focus on how to set up catalogs, why to do it, what you get out of it, um, and how to how to make the how to make the most of it. Um, so what I'm going to start out doing is I'm going to open up a file browser and just show you where all my photos are. So I've got this um, um, drive hooked up on my computer here that looks a little bit asleep. Let's see if it'll wake up. And I'm going to import, so images, Jeff, there we go, a um, whole bunch of photos here um, from a bunch of different um, uh, trips I've taken around the world. So what I'm going to do is, uh, you saw that, browser in the file system view, you can find the exact same thing, obviously, in Aftershot on the file system tab. The, the K drive is here, images, Jeff, and then I'll open that up and here are those same, same folders exactly like we had uh, in the Windows file browser or on Max Finder or Linux uh, file browsers. Um, I'm using Windows here. Things look a little bit different on the other platforms, but uh, all the functions are, are in the same place. Some of the hotkeys are a little bit different. Um, the easiest thing to do is just right click on one of these folders and click import. Um, it's going to show you what folder you clicked on. You can change that if you want to. Uh, you can come back in and, and pick a different folder if you want, but uh, Cambodia is fine with me. Uh, and then what catalog uh, you want to import into. Uh, by default, Aftershot will create one catalog for you. That's this one here. Uh, and that's fine. Um, what we'll do a little bit later is show you how to create a new catalog uh, if you want to separate your work in, into different catalogs. Uh, we'll talk about some strategies about why you m might want to do that um, and those sorts of things. Uh, down in the bottom left, you'll see that uh, it's importing and creating previews. I'm just going to pause uh, creating previews. That's a little trick that I use. It makes the import happen a little bit faster. Um, and uh, for, for what we're doing here, we're not going to be uh, at doing a whole lot of photo editing, so the previews aren't going to be quite as important. So um, uh, at home where I do this, I've got a catalog of about uh, 45,000 photos, uh, and I uh, just let the previews create while it was going through and importing, um, and just let that run for, for a while overnight, and then the next day everything is, uh, is, is imported. Um, so as this is going, what I'm going to do is switch back over to my library tab, and you'll see that Aftershot Pro Catalog uh, 2012, uh, and then you'll see a little abridged version of the um, um, file system view that we were looking at in the in the um, file system tab. Over here you had the, the name of the drive, K, and then Jeff, and travel in Cambodia, and then all the folders underneath Cambodia. In the file system, or in, in the library, what you'll see is that it shows you the drive that it's on, but then it cuts everything off in between the drive and uh, the, the top level folder that I imported. So if you hover over right here, uh, it'll show you the full path. Uh, where is it? Um, popped up there for a second. But um, so it's just a little handy thing to, to keep some of those other uh, folders out of view so you can just see the ones that are, that are in your catalog. Um, now as it's going, you can click on the folders. Let me switch to uh, thumbnail view. Uh, you press F8 or this icon up here in the top right, um, and you can see these coming in folder by folder. Uh, what you can also do, one of the big advantages of, of uh, file system or uh, of using libraries over the file system view, is that you can look at folders recursively. So I'm just going to click on Cambodia here uh, and click this uh, Show Subfolders icon. And what that does is it puts all my folder, all my photos from Cambodia up on the screen at one time. And while it continues to import, you'll see them pop on the screen and the scroll bar moving up as it adds them to the bottom of the, of the list. Uh, while I was in Cambodia, here's a, another little detail. 
while I was in Cambodia, I was shooting with two different cameras, and um, they had different um, file name uh, settings. So if I, uh, by default, Aftershot sorts by name, but if I do that, I get this funny grouping where everything from one camera that started with these underscores happens first, and then everything from the other camera um, that started with DSC is down here at the bottom of the list. Um, so I just tend to leave the sorting on uh, date. Um, that way my, my photos from the beginning of the trip are up at the top, the photos from the end of the trip are down at the bottom, and it doesn't matter what cameras I used, as long as the camera dates were pretty close to, to being in sync, um, and I believe they were for, uh, for this trip. So while it's, while it's importing, it's doing a couple of different things. Um, I've turned off previews, so it's, it's not creating previews. Um, it is creating uh, or, or pulling out a, uh, a picture of the uh, embedded thumbnail. So you get a very quick glimpse at uh, what we were taking pictures of. Uh, this looks like uh, Anchor Watt uh, here. Uh, but what it's also doing is it's going through and uh, pulling out all of the metadata that's embedded in those files. Um, or that was assigned in Aftershot in file system mode or in uh, external applications that was being written out to standard XMP files. Uh, so like these ratings here and the color labels, uh, those were all added um, before I imported these files. Um, so if you do all that work, if you do cataloging, rating, and keywording, and, and uh, even image adjustments on one machine, and move all those images over to another computer, which is what I did here. Um, when you import those, you'll, you'll uh, uh, start right from where you left off. All the settings, all the metadata, and you can also see that in the, uh, the metadata browser here, it's, uh, it's starting to collect. So of the 2,600 images, uh, only, only, three of, only six of them were, were three stars. So it's going to keep counting and keep adding all that up um, and looking through all of the different browsable metadata um, that, that my photos contain. So that th the metadata browser here is one of the big advantages of working in, in, a, in a catalog in the first place. Um, one was that you can do this recursive mode, you can see one folder, um, or you can just select a couple of folders. We'll, um, I'll just hold down the shift key and pick both of these um, folders that were shot um, of the town of Siem Reap in, in Cambodia. So you can see one folder, you can see multiple folders, or you can see one folder and everything below it. Um, real handy just to let you get a very quick view. Um, and then you can also uh, use this together with the metadata browser. So I said we were shooting with two cam cameras, and there they are. Uh, and so you can say, yep, I shot mostly with the D300. You can find all those very quick. Uh, um, so it's very easy to, to use the, the metadata that it's finding, both the stuff that's built in, like make and model, um, as well as the uh, keywords, ratings, uh, things like that. So uh, it finished importing there. Um, so er everything's done. Um, you can go start working right away. If you wanted to let previews finish, you could just uh, unpause, and it's going to start moving through there. And we'll let that go for a little bit. That doesn't hurt anything. Um, and um, so... That, that's, the, that's the first step of cataloging, just bringing your images in uh, and getting them, you know, making them visible so you can start moving through your photos. Um, my first step is always to go through and rate, which I've already done here, so I can quickly say, okay, of, my, uh, of all my uh, photos from Cambodia, um, just show me the, the better ones, the, the, the one star or better. Uh, you can also just do that with the filter toolbar here. Um, th there's a little bit different about the operation of the metadata browser and the filter toolbar. Obviously, with the metadata browser, you get lots more categories uh, to select your photos by. In the filter, you just have ratings, labels, tags, uh, and then whether the version uh, is selected or not. To always include those in the list or, or, to, or to not include those in the list. Um, with the metadata browser, um, you can combine lots of different things, date and time, aperture, camera settings, ratings, keywords, lots of different stuff. Um, the filter, what I use it for is when I quickly want to switch back and forth between different views of things, um, all photos or just the one star or better photos, uh, for example, or two star or better, three star or better. And you can see quickly that um, the, the thumbnail list in the background there is updating. Um, so that's very handy to do that. 
um, and and it's it's a little bit quicker. Uh, it gets on screen really fast. But the metadata browser itself lets you do. Um, you can do the same thing. You can say one star, two star, three star. Um, but I use it more for um, the the larger level. Like okay, first I want to see all my uh, Cambodia photos, and then maybe just the the high ISO ones. Uh, so we'll go you know ISO sixteen hundred. Uh, 2000. Uh, I've got my filtering turned on there. Let me turn that back off uh, because none of those high ISO ones were very good, so so they weren't they weren't showing up there. Uh, but there are a couple of different op ways to operate there using the metadata browser um, or using the, uh, the the filter panel here. Um, one of the other tools here is um, the link to catalogs and the refine button up here at the top of the metadata browser, and I'll talk about those very quickly. Um, by default, what you'll see in the metadata browser are the entries and the counts here in parentheses for all the photos in your catalog. So we've got uh, almost 3,000 photos here, and um, so they're all listed out in you know the, the focal lengths, the uh, apertures that were shot with, uh, the photos were shot at. Um, what Link to Catalogs does is it allows you to take just a set of those photos. Let's just take, say, these these few folders right here. Um, and then if I hit link to catalog, if you watch the numbers here, they'll drop to include only, um, let's see, only the the few uh, images in in the those folders. So not not the entire catalog, but just the uh, just the 1,300 photos. Um, that were in those few fo folders right there. So it's an easy way for things like uh, lens or focal length, aperture, uh, those lists, they can get really long. Um, I guess focal length is still pretty long because there are 1,300 photos in here. Uh, but maybe if we were to choose one folder, uh, yeah, and it updates. So I just took 200, 200 pictures on this day, um, and then the focal length list is still pretty long. Um, those zoom lenses tend to do that. Uh, but something like ISO would get a whole lot shorter, or keywords. Um, so, so that's what Link to Catalogs does. It shows you the counts and entries um, for the catalog folder that you've selected in the top view. It's a handy way just to shorten the lists here, make it a little more obvious about, okay, on this day, I shot two two-star photos, and uh, there they are, um, 31 one-star photos. Um, the other button over here, or the control on the metadata browser, is this um, refine button. And what it allows you to do is something similar to a uh, link to catalog. It, it, the, the idea is to narrow the, uh, the scope of what's being shown in the metadata browser from everything in your catalog to a, to a narrower set of stuff. Um, link to catalog refers back up to these folders where a refinement is um, based off of what's selected in the metadata browser. So what I want to do is just show the images shot with the D300. Or let's do the, the D5000. There are fewer of those. So I'll select it and hit refine. Everything else goes away. Um, the, the D5000 gets uh, highlighted in red to make it obvious that that's what I'm refining on. And uh, everything else is dropped out. So we just see the counts and entries for the things I shot with this camera. And then maybe we can see, you know, what uh, what days I was shooting on. And we can pick uh, Tuesday or Wednesday, Thursday. Um, and then you can refine again, so we can see. Let's find a day that I shot. I shot a whole lot on Tuesday, so we'll add another refinement. Um, so here I'm just showing the D5000 images shot on the 3rd of November a couple of years ago. Um, and you can keep going. And you can keep adding as many refinement layers as you need to. Maybe you just want to see the one and two star. Uh, so you hold down shift, select both of those, and it adds that as a refinement step. One star and two star. Um, and you can also add these refinement steps and uh, remove them in any order. So for example, I can come in and click the X next to the November 3rd, and it takes that one off. Even though I added it in the middle, now it says D5000, one and two stars, so it's all of them, not just on that one day, but spread across the entire trip. Um, so some handy tools to help you find your photos very quickly, find exactly what you're looking for, maybe just your better photos, maybe um, one shot with a particular lens or a particular camera, particular settings, um, whatever you need to help you get uh, to the photos you want out of, out of the, uh, the large set. Um, 
very quickly. That, that's what cataloging uh, and asset management is all about. Um, so when we imported Jeff? those, yeah. I just had a couple of questions that came in I thought would be a good time to ask. Okay, great. Um, the first one is the uh, when you're importing those those photos into a catalog, is it actually copying them to the catalog or is it just a pointer in the file system? No, it, it doesn't copy the files. That That's a good question. Um, if you go into preferences, you'll see this uh, default catalog location. Um, and that's set up, um, th this is the, the um, value that will be set up for you. It'll be your name and not mine, but uh, that's the, the, the location where the catalogs are uh, stored on your computer. And that's where this default catalog is. So what I'll just do is open up a file system browser and paste to show you, to show you that catalog. So this catalog, th this is what a, an Aftershock catalog looks like. It's just a folder on your computer, and uh, it doesn't hold the images itself. Um, so the catalog can be in a different place from the, the photos. Um, and this, is, um, this can be good for a couple of reasons. Um, one is that I don't back up, we'll, we'll talk about backup and archiving um, a little bit later, but I don't back up my catalogs. I just back up my image files and the XMP files that hold all the settings associated with those files. I can always recreate a catalog if I happen to lose it from the images and those settings files. So that's what I back up. Um, so having the images separate from the catalog makes the, the backup and archiving a little simpler. Um, and also the, the catalog um, gets accessed, read, and written to quite frequently. Um, there are databases in here that hold you know, lists of all the photos and settings and ratings and keywords and those sorts of things. Um, so locating this on a fast hard drive, local hard drive, um, instead of maybe an external drive where your images are, um, either a USB drive or eSATA or um, images on a network drive. Uh, it's fine to have your images in that sort of location, but having your catalog on the computer um, that you're sitting in front of um, instead of on a network or on a USB drive will make the whole operating experience um, of Aftershot a whole lot faster. Um, so that was a long answer to uh, to a short question, but uh, it, it's a good point to uh, uh, to drive home. Is that the, the, the catalogs are relatively small um, compared to the size of the image files. They get read and written uh, a whole lot, so making sure that those are um, very quick and can be accessed quickly will make your your cataloging experience and general use of catalog uh, a whole lot easier. Cool. Thanks, Jeff. You bet. Um, I have another one here, and I, I, I hope I'm ex explaining it properly because I'm not quite sure I am. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm going to. But uh, when you're selecting a rating setting in the metadata browser, when you're kind of filtering mm -hmm. for those, uh, for example, say two star, yep. is that going to reset uh, perhaps if you have a filter view on that's showing three star images? No, it doesn't. And that can cause a little uh, confusion. So uh, I'll do exactly that. Um, I've now selected... Um, let me turn this refinement step off. I will show you all of my two star photos. There they are. Um, and now I'm going to filter and say show things only that are three stars and more. Well, nothing, nothing matches. Um, if you look down in the very bottom, you'll see it says zero images, 74 hidden. Um, so there's, there, there are two indications that, that filtering is happening. One is there. It'll tell you how many are, are D didn't meet your filter criteria. If I turn off filtering, then they'll pop right back. It says 74 images. Um, if I turn my filtering back on, they disappear. So that's a good place to look if you're, if you're not seeing something and you think it ought to be there. Um, and also, when the fi filtering is turned on, the little filter icon up here, or funnel icon, will turn green. So even though the filter window is gone, the filter is still active, none of my images show up, um, and there, th there are those two indications that that's happening the count of images down here, and the fact that the filter is green here. Turn that filter back off, the filter turns gray again, all my photos appear. Cool. Uh, I've got a couple more, and sure. I think these two are related. So, um, if, uh, if you move the file to another folder, will the catalog automatically update? If and you, I guess the same kind of question is, okay. if it gets moved, is the catalog no longer valid? So I guess it's kind of where, what happens if you move your files around? If you, if you do your file moving from within Aftershot, um, if you were to, you know, find this folder, pick a bunch of images, and then drag them to another folder like that, I'm not going to go ahead and do that. 
uh, since these are all organized by date. But if you do it within Aftershot, then the catalog will know that that happened, and, and it'll update that automatically. Um, if you if you do it outside of Aftershot, if you switch back over to your file browser and go into your pictures folder and move them around, then Aftershot won't know that, and they will appear offline. Uh, one of the advantages of a catalog is that you can um, view offline folders or, or offline uh, uh, images. So what I typically travel with is a very small netbook computer that has um, a great big catalog, a catalog of uh, 40 or 50,000 photos, my, my whole collection. But there might only be five or 10,000 photos on the actual computer there. Um, the rest of them I can see thumbnails for. I can see my ratings and, um, and uh, other metadata. Um, but the images aren't there. So if you, as long as you move the photos inside of Aftershot, then everything will stay um, intact and linked back up. Um, if you start to move them in um, the file system view, then what you would need to do is, is uh, import, re-import that new folder that you moved them to, and it will find them and, and bring those in. Cool. Okay. Uh, I think we're good for now, so please carry on. <laughs> okay, great. Um, so, yeah, so I, so I hit a couple of topics there that I, that I, that I wanted to mention. One was um, where the catalogs are stored. Um, one other thing that I want to talk about, um, I alluded to right at the beginning, was when you're doing that importing, um, you can choose, we'll go to Honduras this time, say import folders. Um, you can have it um, add to an existing, full, uh, existing catalog, or you can create a new catalog. Um, or open an existing catalog if, uh, if you move a catalog from one computer to another. So let's talk about um, what we call movable paths, movable catalogs, the ability to use one catalog um, on multiple computers. And this can be a little tricky. Um, you can only use the catalog from one instance of Aftershot at a time, um, but if you have uh, multiple computers, um, uh, you can you can move the catalog from your notebook to your desktop, and you won't have to re-import them. You can pick up the catalog, all the settings, um, and uh, and and take them to the next computer where the new images are, and have that uh, uh, catalog uh, find the photos and and, and work. Um, so we'll talk about that very quickly. Let's go back to the library mode, library tab, and we'll talk about setting up a movable catalog. So. Um, on this computer, uh, all of my photos are stored on this K um, drive. It, it's called K. Um, if I had a notebook computer and copied these um, images over, um, it might be on the, the internal drive C. Uh, so what I would need to do to make this catalog usable on both of them is right click and say set movable paths. Um, this dialog comes up that will say um, here's how you can set movable paths. None are configured already. We'll go ahead and add one. Um, and this is very handy to do right when you uh, create your catalogs. Before you, you, you can do it once you've moved it to another computer, um, but it's easier to do it right when you set up the, the catalog if you think you're going to be moving that catalog from, from computer to computer um, because uh, you just remember when, when to do it and what the uh, drive is called on this machine. Uh, so what I'm going to do is select the, the top level um, folder, this, uh, this images folder that all my images are in. Um, and that's going to be um, what my, where my catalog, where this catalog thinks those photos are. Um, they're in K colon images. And then since we're using this machine here, I'll go back again and say K images and hit OK. So that's all I need to do on this machine in order to make this catalog movable. Uh, so what that means is that I could take those photos, that whole uh, K, um, all the images on that K drive here, uh, maybe just the Cambodia ones, maybe just a folder from within the Cambodia um, uh, set uh, any particular day. I could copy that to a new computer and put them on the C drive. I could also take this catalog and uh, copy it to that computer, probably also on the C drive. Um, and then open that catalog, and in that second machine, I would need to come in and say, um, uh, you, you would have to edit this, this local um, 
setting here to be C colon images or wherever you stored those photos on your other machine. Um, so it, 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 it's a complicated topic. It's hard to show with only one computer here, um, but it's important for the folks that, that do want to use a single computer or a single catalog on, on multiple computers, maybe uh, um, over a network share or, uh, or something like that. It's very, very handy um, if you want to um, share the catalogs on, on multiple computers. What you can also do here is add a note so you can say uh, all Jeff's photos. If you import different kinds of photos that are stored in different locations, um, I can import um, catalog, uh, images from C, D, E, F, lots of different uh, drives into one catalog. Um, each one of those would need its own entry. Um, and you might name them, um, just edit a, add a note here so you can remember, oh yeah, these were my travel photos and on this computer the travel photos are on the D drive or something like that. It's just for your reference so you understand where um, those photos were, what they are, and uh, how to find them on your, on your other computer. Um, and then one thing you'll notice is that on this computer with only one computer, once you've set up movable catalogs, um, it doesn't have any effect. So you can set this up and, and um, you know, try this out, but uh, if you're not using this same catalog on another computer, then uh, th this feature uh, uh, it neither hurts nor helps you. So you can set it up if you want to um, or, or not. Um, it's only useful if you're um, trying to move catalogs around. Um, okay, so that was... Um, uh, how to use how to use a single catalog on on multiple computers. Um, what you can also do is um, obviously have multiple catalogs um, using the same photos. So if your images are on a network drive or a USB drive that you move around, you can access the same photos from two computers without having to share the catalog, um, and that's usually a lot easier. Um, so what that does is um, every time you make a change, one of these uh, ratings or adjustment, it's going to update the settings file that, uh, that lives with, with the photos. Um, and then when you launch Aftershot on, your, on the other computer where you have them imported, if you browse to that folder, it'll find those adjustments and it will, it will update that catalog as well. So it's, it's handy um, to be able to use photos on multiple machines without having to, to uh, share catalogs. Okay, so with that said, I want to talk a little bit, if there aren't any questions on, on that uh, section, I want to talk about uh, managing settings. Uh, so what I'm going to do is come back over here into the presets. Um, or preferences, and uh, up here there's a, uh, a folder called uh, the, the user folder location, or, or where your settings are stored. And I'm just going to copy that on the clipboard, go back to my uh, Windows file system viewer here, and hit, uh, put that in there and hit paste. And um, these are all of the different folders and files that configure how um, Aftershot works. Um, and there's some interesting ones that are handy to have in sync across multiple computers. Um, so when you move from one computer to the other, your notebook or your desktop, um, Aftershot's familiar, it's set up the same way, it looks the same, all the batches that you've set up or presets, um, all of those come over with you to that other computer. Um, and uh, the, the interesting ones are um, these here. Um, batches, if you set up custom batches, they're, they're stored each in a, in, a, in a dot .batch file here. Um, copy sets, which is a really handy way to uh, speed how you copy and paste settings. You can uh, associate a shortcut with uh, copying different kinds of things. I'll show you that in action here in a second. Um, and then plugins, if you have plugins installed, I don't have any third-party plugins uh, installed right here, so that folder is empty. Um, and then presets, if you uh, make your own presets, those will be stored in this preset folder here. Um, you can share these with your friends, post them on the forums, uh, email them around, or just copy this whole folder from one computer to the other so all of your presets um, with your favorite settings uh, come right along with you. Uh, there's several other folders here. Um, it doesn't hurt to copy the, the entire Aftershot um, 
folder from one computer to another, um, but this cache can become very large. So if you browse around in the file system uh, a whole lot, um, this cache folder can be can become large. Um, this is a nice clean install, so it's it's nice and small. Um, but uh, this one's unnecessary to move from one machine to another. It doesn't hurt anything, um, but it it can be quite large and and, and doesn't gain you much by doing that. Um, but uh, things like just the copy sets and just the presets are real handy to copy those folders from one machine to another. Um, I talked about copy sets, and and that's a really interesting. Um, Tool, so I want to drill that into a few more in, for a few more seconds, um, unless I'm skimming over questions or anything that we need to touch on. And I guess not, so we'll st steam ahead. Um, so you can copy settings from one image to another by hitting Control C. That's going to copy almost everything. Um, you can copy a, a, a set of settings um, less than everything by hitting Control Shift C. You'll get this window which is, um, allows you to choose what settings you want to copy from one image to another. Um, for this, the, the image that I had selected, um, uh, photo management and, or color management and exposure had been, had been adjusted. Um, so only those are going to be, only those are going to be selected. But maybe I only want to do the exposure adjustments. So you can do that, hit OK, and then just the, those uh, exposure settings. Uh, have been uh, or are on your uh, clipboard. So now you can go to the next image, hit paste, and, and only the exposure settings, um, which for this image looks like a little um, highlight. Um, not sure what those exposure settings actually were, but we can ask it. We can go back to the the uh, um, hit Control Shift C to open up the settings again and open up that whole dialog. And you can see the settings were changed for my auto level settings. Uh, the, the shadow and highlight. Um, it, it'll automatically choose the ones that are that are not at their default value. So if I go back in and uh, maybe drop exposure on this one a little bit, and then open that dialog back up, you can see that my exposure adjustment uh, is now checked. Um, what the copy sets do, if you open up the preferences again and select the copy sets um, heading here, this allows you to associate a shortcut key on the keyboard uh, or key combination. Whoops, I just uh, reset that. Let me, uh, let me do that. Uh, uh, it allows you to associate a shortcut with a particular group of settings. So it's very easy to copy just metadata and IPTC information. If you double click on one of these, it'll open up that uh, same dialog and it'll show you that it's just going to do the um, uh, some IPTC or metadata. If we go to exposure, it'll show you just which settings are, are uh, adjusted there. Um, and you can create your own. So we could do one that has, uh, let me turn everything off, and maybe just um, uh, maybe our, our GPS settings. Um, so if you if you didn't have uh, a GPS device in your camera, but you did uh, manually enter GPS information on, on one file, um, you could use this to copy and paste those settings to multiple images. Um, so if you get good at using this, um, this can be a real time saver. You can associate um, control one or, or uh, uh, here it is, control nine with just your color, your ex exposure settings, control eight with just your color correction settings. So very quickly you can make lots of different adjustments on, on photos and uh, copy just the color settings and paste them to another photo or just the exposure settings and uh, paste them onto another photo. Uh, very, handy to, very handy tool here um, if you really start working with lots of files to help you uh, move through your workflow really fast. Um, and then if we switch back over to your settings folder and go into the copy sets, each one of those is in its own um, XMP file. So this is what you'd want to copy from one computer to another to make sure that um, all those uh, copy sets that you're used to using on one computer are also available on your other machines. So um, one sort of advanced topic there, um, and this is something that I showed um, back in the uh, in, in the Bibble Labs days, and I'll, I'll put a tour, tutorial together about this. Is um, it can be really handy to share a few of these folders 
um, uh, using something like Dropbox across multiple machines. So as soon as you create a new preset or new copy set, it automatically gets synced across multiple computers. That's a real handy way to make sure that your, your Aftershot settings um, stay in sync across multiple computers. Uh, very quick and easy. It's something you set up just once and then forget about it, and uh, it just keeps those all up to date. Very handy there. Okay, um, one other thing that we talked about very briefly was uh, right at the beginning were um, the XMP files, the settings files. What I'm going to do is switch over to my uh, where my photos are stored, which is back here, Cambodia. We'll just pick a folder. And you can see that there are my raw files. And with each one of my raw files is one of these XMP files. Um, and you'll notice that the file name is the full file name, the original extension, and then the .xmp extension. Um, so these are Aftershot um, XMP settings files. And what these do is they include all of the image adjustment settings, all of the ratings, uh, metadata, um, and, uh, and image adjustment settings, um, and record those um, in a very small text file and uh, those are the important files that has all the information, everything that you've changed about your photos stored in them. So for archival standpoint, um, what I do, um, I mentioned this earlier, but I just back up my images. I don't worry about backing up my catalog. Uh, there's virtually, the only thing that's in a catalog that isn't also in, uh, um, in those file system XMP files is if you stack um, multiple master files together. Go right click stacking and, uh, and and choose stacks. If I pick one folder here, um, pick a bunch of images or here, we'll, we'll do these three. Um, they're kind of similar. Stacking. If I were to hit stack here, um, that one bit of information, those multi master files, um, stacking those together, that's the one thing that's not um, recreatable from the from the images in their XMP files. Um, so if that's not a feature you use or you don't mind having to recreate that, um, then you, you lose nothing by rebuilding that catalog from scratch. Um, if you were to lose a hard drive or move to another computer, um, so, so that's a nice handy thing to remember. Just, just back up your, your uh, images, your uh, XMP files, uh, archive those, um, and you'll always be able to recreate your catalog again with all of your settings intact. Um, and you don't have to worry about actually backing up your, your catalog itself. Now, there are two kinds of XMP files. The ones you see here, um, as I mentioned, um, have the file name, the original extension, and then XMP. And that's sort of a unique naming standard that uh, Aftershot uses. If you use Adobe products um, like Bridge or, or Lightroom, um, you, they will use the file name um, dot XMP. They'll drop off this extension. Um, and there's a couple of reasons that we use this naming, pa naming pattern instead of the, uh, the standard um, naming pattern. Um, and the, the big one there is that um, using, uh, if you don't include the extension, that means you can only have one set of settings um, per image uh, per per uh, file, um, so if you shot raw plus JPEG, you couldn't have separate settings or separate metadata on those two files, uh, and that's a big limitation. Um, by using the full name and extension, you can have separate XMP files for the raw files and the JPEGs. Um, and then the contents of these files are also a little bit different. They're not interchangeable, um, so it's good to know that, um, that Aftershot will always write out um, Aftershot XMP files. Every time you make an adjustment, it'll write out one of those. Um, but if I were to go import this whole catalog, this, this folder, into any XMP aware application, uh, very few of them uh, know how to read um, these files, the, the, um, dot, the file name dot extension dot XMP. What, they're, um, what they will look for is just file name dot XMP. Um, and Aftershot won't create those by default but you can create those on demand if you want to. You can right click on a catalog uh, or a folder um, and say, uh, 
write XMP files, or I, see, I guess you have to do it for the whole catalog. Um, catalog, write X, uh, aftershot XMP files, or write standard XMP files for the entire catalog. Um, or you can just grab a, a group of images um, and say XMP, write standard XMP files. Um, so for folks that are only using Aftershot, they're not using multiple tools, um, this is irrelevant. You don't need to worry about it. Um, for folks that are moving from um, other XMP-aware tools to Aftershot, we're going to find all those settings, all those metadata already. We're going to pick those up, and we're going to create um, Aftershot XMP files. We're going to find all those um, metadata that you've added in the other application. But the edits that we do, the adjustments, will only be written out to Aftershot's XMP files. If you want them merged back into the standard XMP files, you can do that, um, either by selecting a, a bunch of files and doing it one file at a time, or for the whole catalog, but Aftershot won't do that automatically for you. So that's just something to, to keep in the back of your mind. If you, if you use multiple applications um, and you want to sync and share and make sure all that metadata is up to date. So I've just done a whole lot of talking. Um, I see the, the questions list here uh, has, has grown. Um, I went over things pretty quickly, so, but that's all I had prepared. I'm, I'm uh, willing to go back through any of that at this time or uh, field any of these questions. Well, perfect timing because I have a couple. Super. Um, now, if you could go back just to, uh, just to review the, uh, the difference between filtering uh, star ratings versus uh, showing them in the metadata browser and how that affects the visibility um, sure one way sure. versus the other um, um, it, it doesn't affect the visibility at all it, it, it's the exact same thing I can say I can um, show all my photos in Cambodia down here in the bottom you'll see there are um, 2900 of them and then filter for only my three star ones and I've found down here in the bottom seven and the metadata browser also shows me seven so it's, it's um, exactly the same thing as if I were um, to click on Cambodia and just choose the seven here. Um, the reason that it exists, the reason that, that it's different is because maybe you are just moving through lots of different um, catalogs or, or um, metadata sections and you want to quickly toggle on and off um, a filter. This won't unset my 200 here. I don't have to, you know, shift click. Uh, it's just a, a little bit easier, a little bit quicker way to quickly toggle on and off um, certain filters. Maybe you want to see just the two star, just the three star, um, one star. Um, maybe you want to see only one star, only two star, only three star. Um, so functionally, they're identical. Um, the, the filter is just a little bit quicker to turn it on and off, just those, uh, um, um, uh, you know, one, one criteria that you're filtering on. Um, and then, obviously, the, the filter um, has, has less entries. It's just ratings, labels, um, and the flag. It's not the full list, ISO, focal length, date, time, keywords, uh, that sort of thing. Okay. Um, for the uh, just to go back to the XMP um, files, yep. uh, you mentioned that uh, writing the standard XMP file procedure is that something that has to be for is performed after all edits? Is there an always on kind of feature? No, there's not an all. Oh, you for the for the Bibble XMP files um, that will happen every time you make an adjustment. Um, so every time you touch a file, every time you adjust it, about a second or two later, it'll update that file. Um, if you don't want that for some reason, you can go and turn it off. Um, so if you're working in a catalog, um, uh, allow automatic uh, Aftershot XMP creation for photos and catalogs. By default, this is turned on, and I highly recommend it leaving, leaving it turned on. Um, but there are some times when you might want that turned off. Um, and those times would be if you're, if you're experimenting with settings, um, in a catalog and you're making lots of changes and you don't necessarily want those changes um, written out to disk, um, you can turn it off. Um, but for most folks, if, you, if, you, if, you, if what I'm saying is confusing, just leave this turned on and it will, it will write those um, Aftershot XMP files um, and it'll keep them up to date all the time. So, you, so it's not something you have to do manually.
Cool. Um, there's a question about keywording uh, and searching sure. by keyword through catalog. Um, I don't know if we showed that. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, that that's good. Uh, it's something I wanted to talk about and uh, and didn't. So. Um, when you add keywords to your photos, they will show up here in the keyword list. And you can say, okay, let's see just photos of lunches or photos um, of Ram National Park. Um, real handy way to use the metadata browser to browse by topic or by person or content. Uh, you can use keywords for lots of different things. Um, you can just select a photo and type in a keyword right here. I almost never type keywords. Um, it's error prone. Um, I'm I'm uh, fat fingered and always uh, mistype things, and that would give me lots of different entries for things um, that uh, uh, would just get in the way. So what I use are keyword sets. These are really easy ways to create buttons to assign um, or to remove keywords. Um, and I'll show you how that works here. If you click the manage button. Um, this window will pop up. It popped up on the uh, on the other screen here, so I'll drag it over. And you see two uh, two columns here. Over on the left side are a list of just some example keywords. Um, these aren't keywords that have been assigned necessarily to any of my photos, um, but they're just some things that um, that, that are handy. Um, they define different genres or uh, maybe status, so you can use keywords to say ones that still need retouching, ones that needed need to be edited externally, um, photos that I've sold, uh, you can use keywords for that. Um, you can use keywords um, to denote which sh subject you've, you've shot um, or um, kinds of treatments that you've done. Um, but what I typically do, if you look at my keywords down here, let me close this and open up my, my travel keywords. I have this hierarchy of keywords um, from, um, um, from my trip to Cambodia. So what I did to do that, um, to, to add all those keywords, let me just uh, collapse these to get them out of the way. What I'm going to do is hit this plus button down here and make a keyword called travel. And then I'm going to hit this, this add under, add a child, and I'll say C-A-M-B-O-D-I-A. -A. Um, I am a poor speller, uh, but I think I got it right. Um, and then I'll add another one down here, and we'll call it uh, Tunle Sap, the big river um, and lake that runs through the middle of Cambodia. Um, so now I've created a keyword hierarchy. It's travel, Cambodia, and then a location within Cambodia. Um, or you could do uh, Angkor Wat in the name of the various um, ruins and, and temples in Angkor Wat, or whatever. Um, over on the right is a list of keyword sets, and you'll see that in the, the keyword sets view back in, in the main version of, or main panel of Aftershot, you see um, the, the default set. So here it says default, and it has this short list of keywords, default list of keywords here. Um, so what I'll do is switch back over here, and I'm going to just drag this, uh, whoops, let's, let's make a new set, and we'll call this travel. Now what I'm going to do is drag my Tonle Sap keyword onto my travel set. Uh, and let's put a few more in here as well. Um, like um, pin and um, then maybe, whoops, I don't want that there. I want it here. Um, So what I've done is I've created three um, keywords. They're all um, underneath the Cambodia keyword that are underneath my travel. And uh, I put them in this um, keyword set called travel. So this is real handy. This is what I do. The first time I come back from a trip, I'll create a, uh, a hierarchy for all the keywords, all the places that I went, all the things that I saw, type them in once, get all that set up once, drag it over to um, one, maybe more, um, uh, keyword sets, and then what that allows you to do is switch back and forth. I'm just using my mouse wheel here. Um, you can switch back and forth between um, the the travel set or and this default that that previous um, keyword set. And what you can do is just uh, pick an image and um, let's see. These were 
shot uh, on the Tonle app. And just click Tonle app, and it'll appear. It, it'll add that keyword to that photo. Um, if you don't want to do that, um, hold Control and click again, and it'll remove that keyword from it. So it's a very handy way. And when it does that, uh, let me let me do that again and show you. Um, when I click Tonle app, it's adding travel. Cambodia, Tonle Sap, that whole hierarchy of keywords, not just the word Tonle Sap. Um, so that's a very, very uh, handy way to add a complicated, long nest of keywords um, without having to type it every time. Um, you can also use that to, uh, to undo or, or remove those keywords. Um, one other note is um, back in the Manage panel, you'll see um, over here a shortcut. So what I'm going to do is we'll come up here and we'll call this like, uh, uh, we'll make a shortcut called, um, let's see, Shift D, see if that's taken. Nope, that, that works. And then Shift, uh, Shift T here. Um, okay, and with that done, I can go back and forth between hitting Shift T and Shift D and it'll uh, it'll flip me back and forth between these uh, keyword sets. Shift T didn't stick. Let me uh, accept it. There we go. So I hit Shift D, I hit switch to default. Shift T, switch back to travel. So it's a very handy way to use the keyboard to switch back and forth between these uh, keyword sets. And you can also add a shortcut. Uh, maybe you want Shift. Um, let's see. It's not taking focus. Um, you can add uh, shortcuts to individual keywords here. Um, so you can have a keyword to, to shift um, the sets and to uh, actually add and remove uh, the keywords from your photos. Okay, uh, let's see. I have a question here. Um, again, we're going back to the XMP uh, file. Yep. Okay. Um, if someone's moving back and forth between Aftershot and Lightroom, mm -hmm. it, the question is, does the, the right set an XMP file, does that have to be done each time before taking those images into Lightroom? Is there no way to have that kind of standard always to write? XMP file. The, the only data that's going to be shared back and forth between Lightroom and Aftershot or any two um, workflow applications are going to be the metadata. Um, so my recommendation would be to use one, any one, um, to set up the metadata, the keywords, ratings, labels um, once in one application and then have that brought into the others um, and, uh, and it'll just be a copy of that. Any settings color adjustments, exposure, um, those sorts of settings, uh, image settings that you do in Aftershot won't be shared with Lightroom, and uh, the ones you do in Lightroom won't be shared with Aftershot or, or, or any two applications made by, made by different uh, vendors. So the only information that will be shared is the, uh, is the metadata, um, XMP, IPTC um, metadata. Um, so th that's one example. I, I, so if you're just moving back and forth between, um, between applications because you're experimenting with different uh, treatments or editing tools, then you don't need to worry about this at all because those settings won't be shared between the two applications. Um, if you're actively trying to metadata, to add and edit metadata in both applications, um, it's, um, th there, there are a lot of idiosyncrasies with that that make that challenging, not only within Aftershot, but the other applications as well. The short answer is, yeah, every time you would need to export standard XMP files from Aftershot um, then go over to Lightroom, re-import those files or merge metadata from, from the XMP files to have the metadata that you edited in Aftershot reflected in Lightroom. We've got uh, running out of time, so I'm going to try and uh, grab the last couple of questions here. Um, the, when you added shortcut keys for mm -hmm. the uh, keyword sets, will those shortcuts that you've added show up in the preferences under all of the uh, keyboard shortcuts? Uh... Good question. In, yeah. Let's go find out. Um, keyboard. Um, let's see. So I had a default set. I don't see it in the D. Um, and then my travel set. Um, looks like the answer is no. All right, that's an answer. I'll take it. <laughs> um, the uh, we do have uh, one last question here. I think is going to be: Is there any data shared between AfterShot and PaintShop 
I'm assuming it's in terms of metadata. Yeah, just the metadata. If you do um, uh, standard XMP adjustments um, uh, in AfterShot, those will show in PSP. Um, again, I'd strongly encourage um, using one application to do that metadata adding um, and editing. Um, if you start to use multiples, um, each application, either from, you know within one one maker, just Corel tools or Corel and Adobe and, and other tools. Um, if you uh, if you're relying on those applications to always sync and and, and share that metadata and, and check for updates um, and push their updates back to those files, um, that that can be very error prone. I, I would I would be very reluctant to, uh, to to recommend doing that. But if you use one application, um, um, if if you're using AfterShot to do your cataloging, but you're using PSP to do your um, adjustments, um, the, the settings you add in AfterShot will come right over into PSP and be visible if you then create an output file from PSP um, and include the, the metadata, the, the ratings labels, um, IPTC settings will, will go right along with it. Great, thanks Jeff. And that brings us right to the top of the hour.